Welcome to Intimate Conversations. I'm your host, Alana Pratt. I'm passionate about your relationships thriving and your family flourishing through a healthy, intimate relationship with yourself, with Source, and with your beloved. So sit back, relax, because it's time to get intimate. It is so good to be here with all of you. I love how friends and, you know, part of the community come on and say hello. And I, I'm also glad that virgins, there's a first timer as well on the show or listening to the show. So all of you are completely welcome as I welcome, welcome Brian Bajan. He is the founder of Fearless and he helps students deep, deep elite levels of confidence that allow them to achieve success and connect with people at degrees they never, ever believed possible before. He's passionate about guiding people in the pursuit of their dream life. And he does this by helping them get underneath layers of social conditioning, often unconscious social conditioning, and fears that they've picked up throughout their life to find their most authentic, fearless selves. So I'm going to ask, his bio is a lot longer, but I'm going to ask some questions so we can get more into a, a dance with him. And so without further ado, those of you who are listening can also check him out at alanapratt.com forward slash Brian, that's B-R-I-A-N dash Bajan, which is spelled B-E-G-I-N. All right, so you can start to check him out as you're listening. If you're by your computer, Brian, well, Brian, welcome to the show. And uh, thank you. Thank you for having me, by the way. Oh, it's totally my pleasure. I am I had, excited to be here, and I'm excited to meet your listeners. Oh, wonderful. Um, listeners, I was talking with um, Brian I guess just a couple weeks ago, and there was so much in common about our, I guess, what would you say, Brian, our journeys into this line of work. Why don't you tell people maybe the good, the bad, the ugly, like who were you, how did you get into this, how, how did it all happen? Uh, gladly. Um I started out as a, a very shy and anxious child. I had a lot of fear. And okay. uh, I mean that, that was really family-based fear. I, we, you know, it, it had been passed down from generation. And uh, and I grew up terrified, basically, of people and anxiety, anxiety in my body. I also had some um, illnesses, medical problems going on that were causing the anxiety to amplify. And so wow. I, I actually remember in in grade school, wanting to uh, not go to school and sneak, sneaking home from school from time to time just because I didn't want to, I wanted, I didn't want to be around people. I wanted to be alone. So yeah. I basically grew up to be agoraphobic, you know, not wanting to leave the house a lot, being pretty yeah. antisocial, small group of friends. And uh, yeah. as I got older, I, I spent a lot of time thinking a lot about why this was because I, I began to hate it. I began to hate that I wouldn't, I would run away from people that wanted to be my friends, things like this. And the question in my mind all the time was why and how could I how could I do this? Yeah. And um, when I when I got out of high school, I realized if I didn't do something about this, I'd probably spend the rest of my life miserable and alone. Mm. And mm. that's that. Now I'm 46 now, and that and that's when the journey began. I started studying voraciously every book in the personal growth section. I I got rid of all my video games, my D and D stuff, all the stuff that kept me introverted. Dungeons and Dragons back in the day. <laughs> and yeah, uh, yeah. got rid of all that and said, if I if I keep doing this stuff, it's going to keep me away from socializing. And yeah. it was just a con- it was just like this knowing inside of me, a conscious choice I had to do something. And um, I spent years kind of studying head knowledge, and I I gained all this knowledge, but um, and I could talk a good talk, but I wasn't really changing. I was I became super analytical about uh, it all. Yeah, yeah. And um, and and so I I talked about it well, but I wasn't living it. The uh, uh, That had to change, so then I went to eventually hypnosis college, and that helped a little bit. I started studying mind-body connection, and and um, then I went and uh, I just kept pushing myself. I moved into a yoga community for a while, sold all my stuff, took one bag, said I'm going to live here for, for a year, and I did that. Wow, in, in the States or in India or something? In the States. It was a place I just happened to find. I, I took this another corporate job sitting in a cubicle, and uh, which I hated all the time. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Sure. And this place just happened to be down the street. And I started hanging out down there more and more, going to their healing clinics, talking to people. And they just said, hey, if you want to move in here, you know, get rid of all your stuff. And I quit my job, got rid of all my stuff, got somebody to lease my apartment, and I just moved in. I was fed up with life. Wow. And that was the big, uh, that was the big turning point. 
the big thing with me was dating and relationships. I, I had gotten more outgoing. I was connecting to more people kind of on a mm-hmm. heady basis, but I was talking a lot. And the funny part for me was that I move into this place thinking, well, I'll meet some cute girls here because there's, you know, I'm a spiritual guy and there's spiritual girls. And, well, that didn't work. And, you know, I knew I was being <laughs> still didn't. You know, there were definitely spiritual cute girls there, but it just wasn't changing. Then this guy yeah. moves in, and he had no place to go because he was out. He was out of parole. He was out on parole. Just got out of jail and uh, wow. had no job, had no uh, money, had no car, had no anything. And he moves in there, yeah. and I notice every girl was attracted to him. Every girl wants to date him. All these spiritual oh my girls God. chasing him around. Okay. And so this is where I was like, okay, something is really going on here. I can either hate this guy. Get yeah, to know this, yeah. know this guy and be his friend. Yeah. And uh, that was the big shift. I, I ended up moving in with him, even though he had no money. Probably a bad move, right? And uh, uh-huh. I moved in with him because I just wanted to watch his behavior and see who he was. And I moved in with him and a girl that was a good friend of mine. And that's kind of where I started to really study human behavior at an intimate level. I just noticed this guy gets on a dating site, and one, one girl after another is coming over to hang out with him. And I'm like, dating sites, I don't even get one hit. How is this guy getting all these hits off these dating sites? I couldn't understand it. Yeah. And that was the beginning of the journey. And I started to really hang out with people. I started making friends. Instead of reading, I started making friends with all kinds of people. They are already living the way I wanted to live. It was not just mm. him. I started expanding out and I started chasing them down, finding people, mm. making friends mm. with them, and connecting with them, getting advice from them, ment- being mentored by them. And... I learned a lot in a short period of time, and I quickly fell in love because huh. I met a girl that was more interesting and more confident and more outgoing than any girl I'd ever dated before because I was changing. Yeah. And then I and then the, the thought in my mind the whole time that I that I was going out with her for the two months or so that I did was, when am I going to blow this? How long is this going to last? Mm. How long until I? And yeah. I couldn't stop that thought. I couldn't mm. stop it for the life of me. And of course, I created that. It fell apart, and that uh, that was the next big movement in, in my growth. That, that that was about two to three months of depression, and 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 then I just went for it. I dove in, and started taking you know, workshops, teachers, teachers, there's all kinds of them, and I I probably spent honestly several hundred thousand dollars in coaching from different teachers, not just on social, but on all kinds of stuff, traveling getting mentors, um, working really hard, learning a lot about getting into your body. Embodiment became the key for me once I understood how that works. And I had one mentor I was with for four years that said I was so far out of my body, it looked like I was trying to, I was above my head. Mm. And um, and he was he did a lot of work getting me to, to feel into my core, feel into my gut, relate to my body again so that I could communicate emotionally with people. Who and, was that um, one? You, you his name was, his, yeah, his name is Carl Wolf. Uh, Oh my god, I've worked with Carl. Oh, Have you? Really? <laughs> yes, a long time. Like wow, wow. Before my yeah, family. he he was hard on me, but it, it it had a huge effect on my life. He's he's hard. So, he is hardcore. Yeah. yeah. Wow. See, we even had that in common. We didn't even know it. Didn't know it. No, he actually just okay. came out of retirement too. So. Oh really? Interesting. Yeah, well, I just started sending blessings. emails from him again. So. Ah, we send blessings to Carl. So keep your story going. I, I'm very um. It, keep going. You're awesome. And so that was that was the beginning. You know, I, I did a lot of work with him where I was just, it was heavy embodiment, feeling my body, feeling all the the, the crap that was stored deep down inside mm. that I didn't want to face. And one of the things I noticed um, that I had told every story, so he was, one of the things Carl would say to me is, tell me your, your deepest secrets because you need to get them out to heal. Yeah. And I would tell these secrets, but to me, I've told everything. There's nothing I'm hiding. I've, I've tried to work through it all. That was my intent. I went through every moment. I used to, I used to, and mm-hmm. and I hit this one. I started to go back through them, and I hit this one while we were doing a movement class. And and all this emotion came out of me, and I started to well up, and I started to cry mm-hmm. a lot, and all this stuff came out of me, and it was it was really a, a moment. And I'm like, I've told that story a bunch of times, and I don't know why I'm crying now. It's, I've never had this reaction. And, and mm-hmm. you know, he said something that was very pivotal in the way I even teach now, and in my understanding is, he says, you've never told it from feeling before. You've told it from your head. Yes, and yes. And that was when I realized that I had done a lot of work, but I hadn't done the work. Yeah. I had, I had done the work on the surface, but on down and on down and the emotions, the feelings, the, and, and, learn, and then learned how to release them. 
And right. I had to right. I had to build the story inside me from that point on that I could go through these and actually let them go. And then there's beauty on the other side of each one. More self love, more self love, more self love. Yeah. And that's what my that's what my journey became about. And then eventually, I started a dating coaching company. And what drove me nuts about it was, um, and it was all about inner work. It wasn't about techniques and pickup or any of that. It was about inner work. Yeah. And and becoming the most powerful version of yourself, confident, attractive, feeling based. It was a lot of body based work, and and it was great. Um, but what I noticed was, that even though I worked primarily on dating, what most of them needed, most people needed, was more feeling, more confidence, and then most of the dating results. And they just, and they just, they just needed to know, have a few tips. If I worked just on dating, it went very slow. When I when I, I when I switched that paradigm and said, "Who are you? What do you want?" Mm-hmm. What are you about? What are you, what are you feeling? Can you be honest with, with, the, with, with, in, the, in this case, I was working primarily with guys. It's like, can you be honest with women and real rather than trying to make them happy? Um, yeah. and I had to really show them what that felt like because they, they, guys just didn't understand the difference. Um, right. and doing it from your body, talking from your body, listening from your body, that, that changed everything. And that's, mm. and everything's grown over the years from there. And, um, and I've gone through my ups and downs. Even then, I, I went through. I had to go through a whole year of a journey of healing my body from all the health problems I talked about earlier. Oh, and that wow. changed my life again. And so, so wow. Uh, you, yeah, this ahead. is a, you're a beautiful man, beautiful, beautiful story. And you know what's kind of funny? And then I'm going to ask you some questions. You know, the music that came on as we started, that was from a woman I met in Carl's class. She oh really? Created, yeah, she created music for well, she creates music for um, movies and stuff. So um, just such a crazy circle. I love that. that I love have. all the synchronicities, you know, the connections. Yeah, totally. So, um, so what we we really I love the work you do because we have this so much in common about like working from the chin down. And my one of my gifts is when people are in front of me, they they're so you know. Non, I'm so non-judgmental. I'm just so unconditionally loving that that those tears kind of come up in my space quite quickly, and then we can we can remove them. And yet in life, that's not so safe. Let alone, let alone even know mm-hmm. how to get out of your head and into your body. And you spoke of the word embodiment. So could you define what that means for you, um, and then explain a little bit about how you dropped out of your head and into your body to begin to truly feel, and then kind of describe what feeling means to you. Oh, yeah, gladly. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a buzzword right now within the healing communities, movement uh, and stuff like that. And yeah. uh, for me, movement means integrating your, your, your body the, the neurology of your body with with your consciousness, your awareness. In other words, taking all that. If you had a record player and your head was a record player, most people it's running at a really, really high speed and it's just, yeah. just going all day. Or yeah. uh, a computer, it's just it's speed and speed and, and all that energy. If you only had a hundred circuits of energy, which is for the analytical people, you got to take that that hundred circuits and get it out of that com- that that computer up there and get it down into the body, get it flowing yeah. down the body. So the the brain actually becomes more silent, and the body takes on all that energy. Then what happens is that it, that awareness goes down the spinal column for the scientific people. It goes down into the body, and then it connects to your nerves, it connects to your gut, it connects to your intestines, connects to your heart, and you begin to feel life through your body like you're meant to. And yeah. your body's your vehicle. And imagine trying to drive on the freeway without a car. Imagine, you can't have mm-hmm. a life without your body, yet we're trying to live our, by, our life with all our energy in our head. Totally, and and you you cut out of the gut. The gut is in the second brain. It talks about talks about it all the time now. Just Google gut as a second brain, and it's an instinctual brain, and it tells you what to do, how to move from instinct, and it's this, it's like a supercomputer. And if you trust it, like like all the most successful people in the world do, they all talk about it. It will guide you right to the top. Um, mm-hmm. but you got to be in tune with it. You got to be like dancing with it in alignment. So embodiment for me is about moving all the parts of the body and developing awareness and feeling in every part at a really subtle level. And yeah. and my my concern with a lot of people is I see some people doing it purely mechanically and they're just working on mm-hmm. the mechanics. To me that's not embodiment, it's structural alignment type stuff. It it helps. And then yeah. I see people I see people dramatizing the heck out of it to the point where mm-hmm. it's all drama. Yeah. Right. And right. 
again, they're not feeling. And so there's space and space in between. And then, and, and when I look at yoga, yoga is one of the best examples of early embodiment. And it's this beautiful art. And when I go into some of these yoga schools where they got rock music pumping, they're lifting weights, they're, they're ba- you know, and I'm like, this is no longer embodiment. This is exercise. Yeah. And because they're not feeling down of their body anymore, they're just training it. And that's not what yoga is about. And um, and so the, to me, getting the exercise out of embodiment sometimes can be really good so we can just focus on the feeling. Little tiny movement here, little tiny movement there, and not get lost in the exercise part. Then adding that right. back in later when you've got the capacity to feel. Totally. Um, when I when I, I first was grew up, I was in ballet class and jazz and tap and all that kind of stuff. The step the step steps was very mm-hmm. mechanical, and you also did them in competition to others while looking in a mirror, having to look perfect, like all this kind of stuff that would send me totally into my head. And then the next phase of my life, I got into being a dancer in Japan, and I chose to be a topless dancer for some of my uh, different jobs. And it was one of the first times I learned about getting back into the body. Because mm. on my side of the stage, Brian, all the men looked at me kind of sleazy. Why? Because I was believing I was a piece of meat. On the other side of the stage, where all the other girls were dancing who had no issues with topless whatsoever, they loved their bodies, all the men on that side of the stage were, they were kind of like Boy Scouts, and they were bowing, and they were just like really nice. I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck? Why is this? And, and so I started to learn that I could... Um, like Tonglen, right? I can breathe in like a monk would breathe in the pain and suffering of the world mm-hmm. and exhale out love and compassion. And I could do the same thing as I dance and I could actually create a different result in the audience around me. And then mm-hmm. I moved to New York and then I moved to L.A. and I started doing different like fumbling towards ecstasy or like Gabriel Ross, these different dance movement courses. And they said, don't you move your body, let your body move. I'm like, What? Um, even though I started to learn about the energy before, I for the first time I slowed down enough, and Carl's work is similar to this as well, where I'm like, who is moving my arm? I'm not moving my arm right now. Who the holy fucking shit? And I started to get, let like surrender and let exactly. life move. And then, some, and then sometimes when I do a coaching session this time and I say, let's expand out and I put my arms to the side to side, I swear there's people on either side pulling. I'm like, holy crap, there's a lot of energy right there. So... So what would you say, or do you do you have a tip, a technique, a process, or anything, even if you want to take people through, whatever, you know, the floor is yours, how can they go from this um, mechanics or the over-dramatization to just truly feeling and being in their body? Well, I'll, I'll share. I was so far in my head, it was ridiculous, and um, and it took me a long time to feel because of that, and one of the key ingredients, there's several ways you can solve that problem if you want to solve it quicker. But if you're on your own, uh, the key ingredient for me was small, small, small movements. And I tried different forms of music till I found the music that really hit me emotionally. And, and, and mm-hmm. then I would move my body to that music, but only at the rate I could really feel the emotion and that the emotion was moving me. So that, at first, that was just my wrist. Mm. And it literally was just my right wrist. I could, it's the only place I could really feel, and I could feel the difference between that and the rest of my body. Yeah. And that slowly in time expanded to more and more and more. And I remember there was a, there was a crying process in that and uh, mm. going into my body. It hurt. But then love yeah. kicked on and the sense of uh, passion and compassion, and it kept growing from there. That's mm. that's one way to do it. Um uh, if you've got a good teacher that's, that's in their body, just watching them move will start to ignite uh, feeling in your body or just watching people that are in feeling move. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, when, you, when, you, when I watch YouTube videos and I see that person feels, you can feel it coming off their body. That's why, they're, that's why everybody's viewing their channel. That's why everybody's watching their, their videos. You can tell because of the, they're down in their core. They're moving from their core. And mm. so that helps me too. And then I go back and do it some more. It's, it's, I don't even have to logically. Matter of fact, it's better if I don't logically understand it. Because as soon as you right. logically understand it, you're using your brain, and you right. got to use your instinct. Um, yeah, yeah. And then, you're... and then, and then, getting with a teacher that knows how to feel and sitting in front of them, and uh, they can guide you down in your body and uh, much quicker than anything else. That's probably the fastest way. 
um i've i've uh you know like chat m cell um mm-hmm. and uh and and techniques like that where you actually look at the person and what we're what we're doing in that case is just looking at the tiniest subtlest movements and expressions on your body with a feeling based uh a response and then moving you down moving you down moving you down until you're all the way down in your in, in, in lower in your body and then opening you more and that that's a process yeah um so this those are those are a few different ideas. Um, that's med- that's great. Just meditation too. So. Yeah. Um, and I was just gonna say I was gonna say well <laughs> this is one thing that I have, I'm so passionate about this stuff. One uh-huh. thing I wanted to say was when you do meditation, if you're just gonna do meditation, I think it's beautiful watching your breath, all that stuff. Just there's transcendental where you're trying to get out of your body, and then there's mm. meditation where you're going down and you're opening, you're opening, opening to the environment around you, feeling more yes. and more the environment. That is what yes. I'm talking about. Yes, me yes, me me too. That's such a great distinction because a lot of people think because uh Brian was mentioning when you first begin to enter the body, quite often it's painful before it's blissful because you're going through that layer that you've been not wanting to go towards and you stay in your mind spinning up there. Um quite often in the metaphysical community our ways of meditating or what have you, we leave our body and yeah, of course it's blissful out there in the cosmos. But can we bring that into our body and be that here? That, that exactly. to me is what life is about, is can we in the moment breathe? In the moment can we allow? In the moment can we stay present? Uh-huh. In the moment can we feel and not go anywhere? Um, so, so super cool, super cool. Sometimes, Brian, when I was first getting the hang of this as a coach, because I've been doing this for 17 as my, as my as my business, but clearly, obviously, I'm a much better coach now, and I even would say I don't really like the word healer, um, because it almost feels like superior inferior, which is not it at all. But I am a manipulator in a good way, like a changer of energy mm-hmm. for the highest good, like the old definition of manipulation, you know, to to change something for the highest good. So I can I sense energy now, and I never did years and years ago. But I I I realized very early on coaching, Brian, that if I asked the person a question, their mind would answer. So then I'd start to go, wait a second, uh, thank you. You can go to sleep now. Heart, I need to talk to you. Stomach, I need to talk to you. Balls, I need to talk to you. Cock, I need to talk to you. Breasts, I need to talk to you. Like I would talk to all these vaginas, body parts. You'd be amazed. The truth that would come out when they would go and let go and let their knowingness lead the way. And so, coming back, coming back to you, way back when you were evolving and you were with that one woman, but you were like, okay, when am I going to blow it? Clearly in the mind. And I understand you have a beloved now. What was different mm-hmm. and how did you get rid of that thought and how did How's it going? How's it going in your current relationship? <laughs> well, it um, it, what was different? Uh, now, well, it's years later, years and years and years of let it go. Um, yeah. that was before I had done all this work with Carl and David Data and studied David Data intensively, studied from my other coaches intensively, done tons of movement. And what I've learned now is now that I can feel down into my body, when those types of thoughts come up, I no longer take them as me anymore. I, I, I it's like there's an old saying that I can't remember where I originally heard it, but if the blue sky is you, yeah, there's going to be clouds. No longer, no longer, uh, when the clouds come up, I don't think I'm in the clouds anymore. I'm just like, oh, look at that stupid thought, or look at that funny mm. thought, or look at that weird thought. I just kind of laugh at it. And then I just move into it with my body, feel into it, and eventually it just moves away. And mm. I don't, and because of that, I don't, I don't project it out. If I do project it out, I own it 100%. I say I can handle it, and I'll even talk about it openly with other people, and that helps dissolve it. But I, I don't mm-hmm. talk about it like, oh, poor me, what am I going to do now? Now I say stuff like, wow, look at this thought. I want to bring, I want to put it, put like a light flashlight on it. This is what I'm experiencing. This is what I'm feeling, mm. and I'm feel, and I start to allow my body, like you talked about, speaking to the different parts of the body. I allow my body to talk the feelings there. Mm. versus my head talking about the experience my body's having. This, nice, this nice, distinction nice. is huge for for getting down into the body, and because of that, those types of thoughts really. I mean, every once in a while, something pops up that's you know the right moment, the right time, and I can even just turn to my girl and talk to her about it. Hey, this is what I'm experiencing right now. It's not a big deal. Could you could you be specific without you know be as vulnerable as you feel comfortable with, just so we really get a sense of like what went down, what was actually said, how did it how did it unfold? Um, How did she react? Like all that stuff. Oh, uh, let me think here for a minute. I have to find a specific moment. Um, 
Um, we had a conversation about, I don't know, it had to be about a month ago or so, where that's something, something to the effect of, uh, of, of looking at me and saying, I'm trying to remember the exact words here, of, uh, is I'm feeling, I'm feeling like you, you, uh, right now I'm feeling like you want to, you don't really want to be with me. You just really want to, I'm just here for convenience and for sex, something like that. And I listened to that and I thought that was, my first thought and reaction was, how, to my mind and my body was, that's ridiculous. And then my second reaction was stop and listen, listen to what, and feel her. Yeah. And so I said, really? And she said, yes. And I just looked at her and she didn't, I didn't say much for a minute. And she said, what, 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 what? And I said, nothing. I'm just kind of feeling it right now. I said, do you really believe that? And she said, yes. And I said, wasn't it like three nights last week I just wanted to hang out and not have sex? Yeah, but that's not what I mean. I mean, and she's saying something different now, and I'm just listening. And I'm like, what's really mm-hmm. going on here? And I realized the week before, I had been a little rushed with my business and and pulled away a, little, a lot and uh, had been mm-hmm. in my head rushing. And I looked at it, and I said, what, she's, what I'm getting from this is she's not feeling like I care. Mm. And I just I felt I felt for that in my body, and I said, and and I really felt how it was weird. I could feel how that would that it kind of hurt me because I could see that I was holding back in my own emotions, and I could mm. see where I was. It wasn't just her; mm. this was me, and she was actually right. I was holding back, not letting her see all of me in that that week, not letting her see the sh- what I was dealing with. Right. And so I had to call that out myself. And in that moment, I said, well, what it actually feels like is because it actually took me a little while. I didn't say this right away. I waited a little later in the evening. And then I said, you know what? What it feels like is is I just, uh, I'm not, sh- I didn't show up enough last week. And that's what I'm thinking happened. And and I just started immediately, instead of talking about it, I started showing up right there, connecting with her mm-hmm. more that night, dropping in more with her that night, laying down with her, talking to her, connecting to her, not talking about it. But being the energy, being the beingness of the person I should have been the week before, and all went mm. away like that. That's, and these are just one second, just one second. Those are such great distinctions. I want to break them down so people before before we go on. So the first thing is you said I, um, I you sort of reacted a little bit. Really, like, really, like no, that's not true. But then you said you didn't just turn and listen to her. You said you turned and felt her. It's very mm. different. So talk about that first. Like what is how can I mean, this is for women as well. So, how can anybody feel into somebody as opposed to listen? Well, this is this is where embodiment's important. If you're in your body, in positive psychology, for, for I, I love to talk in both terms of a little bit metaphysical, a little bit scientific, so people who are still mm-hmm. who are in their heads can understand, or people who are more analytical, have a science-based background. Uh, in positive psychology, they have a term called positive inception they're playing with. And I used to call it emotional transference, but it's just basically, you know, it's transference of, of emotion from one person to another. And when you're in your body, you can feel other people's emotions. You can actually go into yes. states where you're like in a bubble with that person and you can feel what they're feeling. You can, you can, you can even get down to where you feel they're a little sick to the stomach. You can feel that. Are you sick to your stomach right now if you're really connected? Mm-hmm. And, um, and those people are also good motivators that can do that well. If you're in your head, you won't have that ability. So the first step is you got to be in your body. Mm-hmm. And um, when you're in your body, then I'll stop and I'll drop down into my body first. And then I'll op- and then it's a practice of opening while I'm in my body, not being closed, but feeling the sense of openness and, to her, inviting her in. And I'm sitting there feeling, seeing if I can feel what she's feeling. The next thing is I can't be codependent about it. I can't immediately get all worried and then want to fix her, make her happy. I have to be mm-hmm. willing to let her sit in it and me sit in it for a bit to get the whole picture. Mm. And to understand what I need to say, need to say, say, what I need to say may not be about making her happy or making me happy. It's going to be about what the moment needs. And so i got to sit and, and really take that in. Yes, so and just I, one second, one second there, because that's so important too. I believe the reason why Brian can do this is because he's been able to sit in his own, you know how I always talk about sitting in the fire, he's been able to be with his own discomfort and move through it, breathe through it, release it, et cetera, so that when he's with his girlfriend, he doesn't have to go over there and fix her. He doesn't have to hide. He can just go through whatever and be unattached and just be present. So that's the how he did that, I think. Did you agree? He, I think there's a lot to that, yeah. There's a huge amount. 
And then also we do a lot of work in the workshops with feeling other people. Uh, for the guys, it's feeling uh, other women and being yeah. comfortable feeling every their rise and fall of their own emotions, pains, their pains, their hurts, and not and their joy and their happiness and their pushing and not taking it. So we do a lot. Of, we do a lot of work with that. So nice. And then, and so that's basically what I did. I just sat in it, and then the information, the, the intuitive hits come to you, and they come in the form of feelings, like I'm feeling emotions, and then I gotta be willing to feel those emotions, and then those emotions, uh, through contemplation, not analyzation, take on a meaning. Um, contemplation, sitting with an idea till it makes till your body gives you that the answer versus your head trying to figure it out, and in that in that moment. I started to see how I had been pulling away and holding back from her and how mm-hmm. I had not been opening up my my body, been closing off, been rushed with her. And uh, and I saw that I needed, to face, I needed to face that part of me that wanted to do that. And mm-hmm. uh, so I had to say that was, what, that was what was going on for me. Wow. Um, how did that resolve for you? Because you, you're so responsible with your growth every time. It sounds like every time something comes up, you just, like, deal with it. So how, in a relationship, as a busy entrepreneur with a lovely girlfriend, how, what, what is the next, the new choice or the new way of being that you're taking on that this experience gave you another, you know, opportunity to choose again? Um, and that, well, the new choice is that I learned to be more open with the world because if, I, if I'm being more open with her, then i got to take that into the world, my business, with everything, and then everything mm-hmm. grows from it. Um, but the thing is, is that process never ends. It's a daily process. Because so, as I grow bigger, or as you grow bigger, as anybody grows bigger, we got to do it again. More responsibility comes in. More people are seeing you on the Internet, bringing you it, bringing you it, and i got to do it again. Because yeah. as I grow, if I don't do it again, I'll stagnate. And that's that goes on for the rest of your life. And Mm-hmm. And you'll you'll feel it when you're not doing it. Something's going to start to come back and tell you. Something's not going to work. Something's going to fight you. You're going to be in a fight. And I've been in fights for with myself for days on end, just trying to feel into it. My body doesn't want to do it until it finally mm-hmm. surrenders. And, um, mm-hmm. and those are uncomfortable moments, but the other side is so rewarding. And, mm-hmm. uh, and to me, that's a lifelong journey. I'm in complete agreement. And it's a journey that I... I it's why I get up in the morning um, because for me, the fear, the, you know, you said your company, fear, fearless, um, people, people at thefearlessman.com. So this idea of fearlessness, I don't think it's possible in the, in the, the mind because you're freaking mm-hmm. out. And yet there's a sense of safety and home that I've never found anywhere through analytical cognitive analysis that allows me to rest, like really yes. exhale all the way. So can you um, – just talk a little bit about that place of home so that – because I think it's really connected to one's capacity to sit through discomfort, one's capacity to not try to fix the other or get all codependent, one's capacity to, you know, something uncomfortable happens in life and you don't rush off trying to run away from the feeling. You can just go, okay, this sucks. I'm just going to keep breathing. Like, I believe if you don't know that there's home, if you've never touched peace or freedom or um, the sense of safety all the way to the core, I think it's quite quite difficult to to be with discomfort. Am I making sense? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's scary. Um, David Nagel, who's a, a business coach, used to call it the terror barrier. You know, there's this nice, and I, it's like being on a football field, and there's these, all these big, huge linemen in front of you. And at first, you're going mm-hmm. down the field. It's it's not. It's all right. Okay, I'm playing the game. I'm going. But as you get closer and closer to the uh, end zone, and you're about to make a touchdown they get meaner and bigger, meaner and bigger. Yeah. And that's all your stories oh. coming up. That's all your thoughts. And uh, it's good. They're going to get the meanest and the biggest and the most uh, violent with you, your thought, right before you cross that finish line. And mm-hmm. when you cross it, it's a sense of huge expansion and freedom. Like you just let go of a huge story. Mm-hmm. And um, you believe of, you believe of about yourself and you're like, whoa, I can do this. Now, the first time you do that process, artists, artists, yeah. And um and that's where I really recommend you have somebody if you're doing it with something big like a like a big move like starting a business it's really important to have a coach or somebody somebody to yeah. to to watch you because your your stuff is going to come up and you're going to be like, "Oh my god, I can't handle this. I can't handle that." And having feedback from others about yeah. who you're being in that moment is huge. Is huge. Mm-hmm. And you got to get those first few under your belt. Then you start to realize more and more that it's 
it's it's all just mind chatter and you can start to detach from it and um and if you've ever seen uh read Richard Branson's autobiography Losing My Virginity it's a great great book Childhood, childhood, childhood is filled with this stuff his child is a little boy his parents journeys were journeys where he's where he faced fear over and over and over again and he ran towards it at 100 miles an hour and they encouraged him to keep going keep going you can do it and in that he developed a habit and it, and what happened is you move from a a fear of crossing that terror barrier to a passion for moving towards the next one. Let's get in the next game. Mm-hmm. Let's do it again. Like professional football players can't wait to get on the field or professional yeah. athlete athlete can't wait to get up there and say, let's do it again. And you yeah. move from forcing yourself to do it towards loving doing it. And that's that's mm-hmm. why I talk a lot about learning to love tension in life. I believe mm-hmm. that whenever anybody manifests anything, they've got three components. They've got a, their thought, which starts with a thought, then mixed with emotion, which is the the fuel, but then you need tension, and then it guides it, it directs it. And if you're scared mm-hmm. of tension, if you're running from tension in life, you're not enjoying the beauty of tension, and you don't see it as beautiful and sensual and fun, mm-hmm. then you're going to have a really hard time growing in life. Life is always going to be about how do I get rid of stress? How do I get rid of tension? And yeah. tension will be destructive to your body. And studies show that when you believe tension is good for you, just like a bodybuilder lifting weight, then the tension will grow your body, and um, mm. and so it's just, it, we we do all kinds of stuff to teach people to fall in love with that process of of loving everyday tension all the way to the big tension right before they cross that goal line. I love it. You would have loved my pole dancing class this week. It was the week of tying ourselves to the pole. It was like it was like, <laughs> like stretch, stretchy ropes, and it's amazing. We don't wear heels that week. We can really get can really get literally tripped up. But um, uh-huh. the idea of of like normally the pole is something we swim around or we climb up, but we're totally free to leave a uh, choice at will. But when the ropes are there and you're in that friggin' like resistant state and then I don't want this and I, you know, I need this to be different. Um, and then there's like the surrender. And then as you were saying, running towards the fear and like you start to shift into the deliciousness and the passion and, mm-hmm. the, and the yumminess of just, be, you know, being with the tension and, and I always used to think that that poor butterfly, oh, dear, poor butterfly, <laughs> suffers and suffers and suffers and then he's happy or then she's happy. Who are we to know? Maybe the the, uh, the butterfly's like, yeah, look at it, it's impressive. Maybe it's orgasmic inside, inside, inside a cocoon. I don't know. But, yeah. It's it's a process, you know, this, you know, the, the, the butterfly. It's all, they're all metaphors for this process that we have to go through in life, every single one of us, every time we grow. And yeah. Tension, I always say tension, life is filled with tension. You do not grow to the next level without experiencing it. A seed in the ground has to dig yeah. roots and then fight its way to the surface and then fight its way through seasons to, to become a tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, sex is tension and then the release of tension in the end. And it's, yeah. it's that tension and release. A baby growing in the womb, a baby being born. Yeah. Um, how about... Uh, uh, and, and everything in life is tension. You think about it. There's a, and, there, and I always say there's emotional and physical tension. Stepping into emotion and facing emotional tension, mm-hmm. then there's physical tension, like on the battle on the battlefield. And yeah. men typically are more are more exposed to physical tension. They get used to it. They love it. They they but they start to love it or they avoid it. It depends on the guy. They have some love for it, even if it's at a distance, because they love football and movies with tension in it. And women tend to be drawn towards emotional tension. And and in that, it, it's it's a real interesting thing. I think that people are craving tension, but they're so scared of, uh, like, tension would be like quitting your job and, and choosing the life of your dreams, going for your yeah. goals. But they're so scared of doing that because the need for security is so strong in all of us that we yeah. end up uh, like passionless zombies walking the street, going to our yeah. cubicle jobs every day. And then we go get our attention where? Books, movies, sitting with a popcorn, a soda, in an air-conditioned room on a cushy chair, watching a Getting football game. Getting killed at a, a giant game. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then, but not the one playing, not the one having the adventure, not the one taking the risk. We're watching yeah. other people do it because we so need it, but we won't do it ourselves. Hmm. And we avoid it in life. And that skill needs to be developed in every one of us if you want to bring, uh, bring your passion back in life and let burning desires come back into your life and let... And let yourself chase your dreams, because otherwise, oh. every time the tension builds, you'll turn and run back to the starting line. Yeah. Tension builds yeah. on that field to run back to the starting line. 
Mm. And so we focus heavily on getting people to face that tension, really. Yeah, I love it. I took, um, what was it called? It was hip, that was it, hypnobirthing, and it's the, the 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 contraction. It's like no, that's just a surge of energy. Mummy and baby are one, and I had and it birth and it birth birth because every time the tension would come, I'd like lean into it, breathe through it, and like he was totally there, super fast eating. I was eating an In and Out burger, and um, it was still uncomfortable. I won't say it wasn't uncomfortable, and the pushing was super hard, but uh, the pain, the pain and the suffering. Uh, more, I guess it would be more accurately said, the suffering that most, I think, women feel in childbirth, I believe, is exactly what you're saying right there. To lean into the tension creates a whole different experience and yeah. uh, result. And I think that's yeah. true with almost every, I think people that are really good with pain are good at, like you just said, exactly like you said, breathing into it mm-hmm. and, uh, and breathing into it feeling it and then re- learning to read their p- p- body in the midst of the pain and then the pain goes away because most pain mm. is caused by fighting what's in front of you, fighting yeah. and resisting and fighting. Oh, my God. This is so true, Brian. I remember that the very first time I was on the stand, I'm going through this custody thing. The very first time I was on the stand, I was terrified. There's a judge and there's this really mean litigator you know, saying all these lies to me and, and there's a lady typing beside you and ah! and your kid's on the line, and for the first 10 minutes, I was terrified. I was tense. I was, like, justifying myself and projecting all this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, something came over me, like an aha. I'm like, wait a minute. I get to choose how I respond. This is my courtroom. And my whole body the back. <laughs> and I said, like, I finished the question, and he kept saying, strike that from the record. Strike that from the record. Like, trying to get me to shut up. Like, oh, ladies, oh, ladies. I think. And, and I just finished what I had to say, more from more from that place of knowingness that we talk about in the body, not a thought. And by the end of that thing I said, I said, what's your next question? Like, I was in charge. Totally different. Yeah, yeah really, really wild. You okay, surrendered um, to, you surrender to your, your gut, really. You went yeah. into love, trusted your gut more than anything else. Yeah, which That's under pressure like thing. that, it's, it's hard. So all of us have our own versions of what that pressure is, but we can do it. Um, mm-hmm. Brian. <laughs> Excuse me, Brian's an amazing teacher for this. So um, it's quarter to five. I have a client right at five, so I want to be on time. But there's a hand that's raised. Are you willing to take a question, Brian? Oh yeah, of course, please. Okay, Love okay, it. okay, awesome. So oh, I'm well, taking. Wow. Oh, so I'm taking. I think it's Peter. Is that... Oh, can you hear me, Peter? Go for it. go for for it. What's your question? Oh, Brian? I was I was raising my hand before. Uh, oh, you don't have a question anymore? Say hi, but well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I heard Brian uh, before <laughs> talk uh, when he was with Andy at DayGame.com. He had a great webinar, and it uh-huh. it wasn't something Good. that you brought up tonight, but uh, something that you talked about. Some of your clients they come with a problem, or if they just are coming for a more self development. It's, if they have a problem, they seem like they can't overcome it. But if they're coming at the mindset of, uh, I just want to get better at this one thing, then they tend to be more successful with that. Uh, can you ask it one more time? Do I get a lot of people that come in with a specific problem? Well, if, with, the, with the mindset of they have a problem they want to fix. And for me, sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm, I, have a, I have a problem. I just I can't uh, – get a date or whatever, but sometimes I feel I just want to improve an area and everything is going better or everything. I just want to improve my life. Most of the clients, most clients are motivated by a problem. That's really what, why they come in the door. The, the bulk of our clients want to, uh, are in their heads and want to get out of their heads for dating and they're tired of all the pickup stuff and it just doesn't work for them. Uh, that's because that's who we market to. We talk to that crowd, you know. Uh, break the nice guy syndrome and become real. Learn to be real. You know this type of stuff. So we talk to that crowd, and that crowd shows up. Um, we're going to talk more and more to crowds, men and women, ultimately about um, down the road, learn, learning to love being uncomfortable and learning to love tension in life. And that when you understand that that when you mix tension, emotion, and thought, you can create anything you want once you master those three things. And um, and those are the those are the skill sets of life. And um, but right, but most of our clients do come in with. A, usually, they're in their head, or they're locked up, or they're holding back their emotions. Some people can feel, but then they, when they get in front of a, a woman or a partner, they shut off their emotions because they're so scared to let that person in. And that's a, that's the type of problem that typically comes in the door. 
Cool. Did that support you, Peter? Yeah, uh, I think the follow-up was like, it seems like I, I remember, Brian, you mentioning that uh, it seems that there's, they don't overcome their problem because they're thinking of it as a problem. Oh, I know. Oh, I know what you're, know what you're talking about. You're talking about a, one of our core philosophies. I get what you're saying. Um, so we have a series of philosophies we teach everybody. They have nothing to do with dating. They have to do with life and having mm-hmm. a powerful relationship with life. And um, we have I have literally thirty some philosophies written down about life, but we we teach a core of nine typically. And one of the most important ones is the one he's mentioning, which is this idea that I and you probably see this all the time, Alana. You go into a seminar, and the room will be filled with people that have been working on themselves for 10 years, 20 years, and they seem about yeah. the same, but they keep going for it, and they're crying in the corner again, and they're crying in the corner again, and then mm. the other part of the room, and maybe they'll cry a little bit or do their thing, but then they grow. And then they're like, wow, that was amazing. And then they go out in a flat afternoon, afternoon and their life changes, and they come back from lunch with stories about all right, the great right. things. And I, and, I, and I started to ask myself, what was the difference between those two groups? And Carl used to say to me years ago, he used to say, Brian, you've got to realize you're not broken. Nothing's going to work until you stop and realize you're perfect just the way you are. And I would sit there and mm-hmm. think to myself, um, well, that's ridiculous because if I'm not broken, why would I come in here? I, I wouldn't even show up. I would just stay home. Right. And that was me in my head. And uh-huh. so years later, I came to the realization I was sitting there actually in uh, in Arizona at another workshop and I was watching this go on and I was looking at the crowd back and forth, back and forth. And it hit me. This half of the room thinks they're broken and they've been, they thought that they're broken for 10 years and they're trying to fix themselves. And for the last 10 years, by law of attraction or the particular activating system of the brain, every time they fix one problem, they find a new one and a new one and a new one because they yes. fundamentally, at their core, believe they're broken and they'll never stop fixing themselves. This side of the room mm-hmm. does not think they're broken. They think they're perfect just the way they are, but they want a new, a greater experience of life. And I realize at that moment that we'll never stop wanting a greater experience of life. That life yeah. is more. That's something David Nagel says. Life is more. And we'll always want to experience more. And so it's like, if I want to go learn to play the piano, am I broken because I don't know how? No. Was Helen okay. Keller broken because she couldn't hear and see? No. She great, no. created beautiful works of art. Is Stephen Hawking broken because he's in a wheelchair and he can't move his body? No. They're, beautiful. They're having beautiful expressions of life because cause we're all experiencing our problems. So either all broken or broken or broken. And at that mm-hmm. point, it just becomes purely about expansion and growth, expansion and expansion and growth, expansion and growth. And then when you shift your mind, that's when you shift out of victim consciousness into real growth, real moving forward. And that, that, that has to be felt deep in the core of your being. It's not just a thought. So I yeah. give people a lot of homework to go out and see it in, in nature, see it in life, see it in people walking down the street, to see mm-hmm. it as many places as they can. I give them assignments to look for it so they can get it down to their nervous system, this realization, because just knowing it is not going to give them the feeling of it. I agree. I love that. What was the moment, even though Carl said, you know, you're not broken, when was the moment that you actually embodied that and, like, knew it as an awareness, as a truth? Oh, it was years later. And it was amazing. It, it, because the way he, he said it was, I, my, I, my, my, my animal mind just couldn't accept it. And yeah. so I was at, um, I was actually hanging out with Chad. Um, and I was at a Sedona method seminar several years uh-huh. back, like three years back or something like that. And I was sitting in the audience and I just, this epiphany came over me as I was watching Hale DeWaskin talk and I was looking at the crowd and I was like, why are these guys are you're still struggling? I mean, this is a great technique. Mm. And I was like, and then it, that's when it all flashed. I'm like, oh, that's why everybody's taking seminar after seminar, but their lives aren't changing. Yeah. And then Carl flashed in my mind and it all came together. And then I just went to town embodying that in my body. And every part of mm. my life has, has radically grown since. Radically. Oh, that's so beautiful. I, I don't, I think the first time, first time, the first times I ever embodied it or got it, like as a knowing and awareness, not a thought, I, my mama just died. And I was at some workshop. <laughs> That's because it sounds like we do the same thing. We keep going to workshops yep. and working with mentors. So um, th- this one was like, okay, now go out and find something. So we're supposed to find something in the trees or find something on the ground. It like, was a thing. Um, and then they're like, okay, now go into the space between the leaves and the space between the trunks and the branches and the mm. space between the grass um, 
the blades of grass. I've never looked there before, Brian. And as soon as I let my awareness go there, boom, my mom was right there. Like, my mom was everything. My mom was, like, she was, like, pressing up into every pore of my skin and in and out of my heart. Like, she had been there all along. I just never looked there. And it was exquisite. It was was tearful, but, like, tears of relief that we Mm. really are one. Tears that we really are, that we really are held. Tears of relief that we really are safe. Like, all the tears of relief, we really are enough. All that stuff. That, and as you just said, that we're not broken. I, that was yeah. my first embodiment of it, um, and I'll never forget that's, it. And that's your Satori moment. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, yeah. I, there's a you, there's, there's a description I give, and you just reminded me of it. And it's and it's the same basic idea. It's uh, I always think of a burned out, abandoned building. Is that building broken? And to a developer, he can make money off of it. So to him, it's beautiful. To a homeless family, it might be shelter for a week. To an artist, it might be perfect for his photographs to create art that inspires the world. Right. Is that building really broken? It's all perspective. And and, and you choose the perspective. And you just chose a different perspective there. You, you, when you, you, got, you got, got all the beautiful benefits that came with that new perspective. Yeah. And, yeah. Which is the gift of your mom and the gift of that connection. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And the gift of the, um, I don't know if we want to call it courage, but like my, this tension that you talked about, the willingness to lean into tension after that mm-hmm. was very, was so much easier because I knew mom was there. I knew God was there. I knew the universe was there. I knew awareness was there. Like whatever you want to call it, like I I touched it, tasted it, um, rested into it. So um, I think that's a very important component as we we do this journey. So um, let us... Let us end, because I would love to talk to you for hours and hours, but I want to be on time for my next mm-hmm. client. So, alanapratt.com forward slash Brian, Brian, B-R-I-A-N, dash, Bajin, B-E-G-I-N, um, talking more about what we've been talking about, a wonderful ebook called Fearless with Women. Can you talk about that? Um, it is, it's about, it's funny, we call it Fearless with Women, but it's really about you becoming more powerful as a man, getting into your body, mm-hmm. learning to be grounded, learning to stand in your core, and learning to be the masculine polarity of the feminine while at the same time having a relationship to your own feminine, you know, and, and, and uh, so that you can better relate to the woman in front of you. And um, and that's what it's really about. It's about, this is the way I like to say it, the guy that is naturally good with women doesn't walk out the door and say, how do I attract a woman? I need a technique. He just mm. expects it to happen. And it's the same thing with a woman to a man. A woman doesn't, does that know and like her, doesn't like her, don't walk out the door thinking, how do I attract a man today? They know men are going to mm. like them. That's the deal, deal. You're built to do it. You're the natural polarity to women. And if there's something in the way between you and that polarity, then you need to start uncovering it. And that this is the process to uncovering it. And that getting into your body, being a masculine man, and 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 working on who you're being first before you even say a word. Who is the man sitting there? How does he think mm. and feel it before he even gets up and says a word and talks to a woman? And um, that's a lot about what, what, what the ebook's about. And um, and uh, it's it's a good it's a good process for I think men who even aren't working on their relationship with women. It's because it's right. you know life life is feminine. Life. There's so much emotion mm-hmm. in life and mm. feeling and depth of feeling. Uh, and uh, in, in that sense, if you get in a relationship with it, life becomes a lot more fun, I'll tell you. Beautiful. So, again, that's alanapratt.com forward slash Brian dash Bajan. And you can also find more about him at his site, thefearlessman.com. So this was amazing. Thank you so much for who you are and all that you shared with us and what we've learned and your vulnerability. The last line of the show, the last message from your heart to theirs, what would you like that to be, Brian? Um, it's funny, it I, I sounds so cheesy, but my tagline, it, it, it fits right here. What would you do if you were not afraid? What would mm. you do with your life if you were not afraid? And I love that because if you really sit with that question, all kinds of possibilities could open. Yeah, yeah. Stunning. Stunning. Thank you for who you are and all you've provided us today. I will see, we'll see all of you next week on Intimate Conversations Live and know that I love you. Bye-bye. Bye.
I used to obsess over these goals, like how am I going to have a good life if I don't have good money, or how am I going to have a good life if I don't accomplish X goal or Y goal. The problem with that is the goals never end. Part of our evolution is to learn to manage the greater capacity of information and teach our subconscious to sort for what we want out of it.